47%. That is the percentage of jobs that can be done by automation in America within our lifetime. Do you know what the proportion is for developing nations? Two-thirds, or currently about 1.6 to 3.2 billion jobs in the global south, if my back-of-the-envelope calculations are correct, and it will only grow in the future. Can you imagine what that would do to the world? A vast sea of unemployed people trying to make a living in a world ravaged by droughts, floods, and famines from climate change. When crop failures force people from their rural areas to the cities, would there even be enough jobs for all of us? Mass, and I mean massive migrations, will make this even worse. And if you look at our history, when capitalism showed its cracks, who was blamed for everything? And who was given power by the capitalists? Now, let me ask you something. What do you do for a living? Maybe you're a software engineer and you fix bugs or do requirement analysis or design database or program stuff. Or maybe you're an Uber driver, and you drive drunk people at night and clean their puke in the morning. Or maybe you're a customer service representative, and you get yelled at by customers all day long. Or maybe you're an executive, licking the boots of capitalists and just love being a parasite. Or maybe you're a civil engineer, or a truck driver, or a cashier, or a secretary, or a phone sales representative, accountant, truck driver, paralegal, fast food worker, middle managers, and I can go on and on and on. Do you know what they all have in common? All of them can be automated. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a decade, but some much sooner than others. It will be a slow process, but it will be steady. You'll see some productivity gain here, some job loss there, some record-breaking profit here, some wages stagnation there. At first, unemployment won't rise that much because there will be precarious jobs, just like how today we have Uber to fill in the gap of unemployment. But eventually, those two will be automated, just like what Uber is planning to do. And as usual in capitalism, it's the working class that will get screwed over the most. But maybe you believe the workers will stand together against this and join together in solidarity with all of the oppressed classes. And yeah, people will most certainly try. But I will argue later that AI will make it extremely difficult for us to unite into one single cohesive collective, because guess who will support the capitalists? Do you think we're ready for this? If you think so, I got some bad news for you. We're getting closer and closer to... This is StarCraft 2, the best game ever made, and if you don't think so, well, you're valid, and you know, I'm pretty sure you have your own opinion, and that's fine. So StarCraft 2 is a sequel to the classic 1998 game StarCraft. In both games, your main goal is to eliminate other players by gathering resources, building armies, attacking your opponents when the time is right, and defending your own base against attacks from enemies. And unlike chess or Go, you have to do everything in real time instead of waiting for your turn. You have to scout your enemy and build your army at the same time. You have to build your bases while defending them from attacks simultaneously. You have to manage each unit carefully to minimize damage taken while maximizing damage to your opponent's units. It's a really difficult game to master because there are so many variables that have to be taken care of while you yourself only have limited information off the map and your opponents. You literally have to make around 3-4 to four decisions per second based off of the limited information that you have and you also need to be able to infer your opponent's intention just by gleaning at their unit composition and position if you want to be any good at it. So why am I talking about StarCraft 2? Well, recently, Google's AI research company, DeepMind, released an AI that beat pro-level StarCraft 2 players. Not just one of the mills pro players either, one of them is one of the best StarCraft 2 players in the world. And it wasn't even close. The AI beat pro players 10 to 1. I mean, they won one game, but only after the AI was made weaker. This is fucking mind-boggling to me. StarCraft 2 is an incredibly deep and complex game. Like, it is several orders of magnitude more complex than Go, and Go is several orders of magnitude more complex than Chess. I mean, the AI would have to be able to read the player's intentions to know what they're planning to do. It would have to be able to react appropriately to situations it has never seen before. And most importantly, it would have to be able to form complex plans while at the same time 
improvise when things don't go as planned. You know, like how people do in real life. Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, 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 wait, wait, wait. I guess I have to explain why I put read and improvise in quotation. These algorithms are not human, and we should not think of them as human-like in any way. To say they're reading someone and therefore they think something is what they need to do is not really how they work. The best analogy I have is like the algorithm has seen something kind of like a situation, and it has an intuition of sorts of what to do next, but again, that's still humanizing the algorithm, so it's not 100% accurate. So here, I use the word read or improvise because that's what I think approximates the internal process of the algorithm the best, while still easily understood by most people. If you want to really understand what's going on, you would need to look at the math behind it. And then we have Elon Musk's AI company, OpenAI. They develop an AI that reads some text and can answer questions based on the text. So they basically developed an AI that has some sort of reading comprehension and it sort of understands what is being written. Like if you give it some text, like for example, an article about 2008 Olympics, you can ask it questions like when it happened, what the theme of the Olympics was, and other basic questions like that. And the answers aren't just one or two words answers. It can answer in full sentences. It can also write uh, articles, I guess you can call it. And these fake articles make grammatical sense and the content is coherent, but as a whole, they are still meaningless. But remember, it's probably only gonna get better with time. And we're still in the early stage of an AI revolution. I mean, we're still pretty far away from a full-blown general AI with human-like intelligence. For example, one of the most important things that an AI cannot do so far is modeling reality like how we can imagine scenarios in our heads. But I think we'll eventually get there. So in the near future, I don't think it will be too surprising to see an AI that is fluent in human languages, can form and execute human-like complex plans, and improvise when things don't go as planned. But here's the thing. Scientists developing AI systems operate under capitalism, meaning the goal is profit rather than, say, I don't know, human development. This is really, really, really important, so let me say it again. Scientists developing AI systems operate under capitalism, meaning the goal is profit. No matter how safely the AI is designed with all of the safety bells and whistles, it will, at some point, harm humans because it is built under capitalism and capitalism exploits humans. Okay, so real world example. You're watching this on YouTube. YouTube's recommendation algorithm is specifically designed to maximize watch time to optimize ad revenues, and it doesn't really care what the content is. A video of some alt-right jackass spewing crazy conspiracy bullshit that has inspired terrorists will be as recommended as a thoughtful educational video if they both have the same metric. Only after things go wrong that YouTube will do something about it, even then it's only some of the time. The point is, YouTube's recommendation algorithm is designed for profit in mind and not, let's say, human development, or, you know, making society better in general, mostly because those are impossible to quantify and profit from. And in the future, AIs will have the same exact driving principle behind them, profit. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to tell you what I think is not likely to happen. Stuff like Skynet or Shodan, that is, malevolent AI hellbent on destroying humanity for some nebulous reason, I think is very, very unlikely to happen. Now, some parts of the internet like to speculate on how AI will take over the world and enslave humankind because technological singularity will happen or something like that, but I mean, that's just straight up fantasy. They assert that AI will self-improve infinitely and make themselves better and better, but I mean, just like our good old friend capitalism, infinite growth doesn't exist. So I wouldn't worry about robot overlords or malevolent AI if I were you. What I would worry about, however, is depressed wages and mass underemployment or even mass unemployment. I think that's more realistic because it has happened in the past during industrial revolution. But this time, it's way more than just a piece of technology. We have only been able to produce goods and the means of production of those goods, but we have never been able to mass produce labor itself. It takes at least 17 years to make a worker, but in the future, we'll be able to plop out robots and automations. Now, some economists believe there will be no mass unemployment in the future, which might be true. They've looked at the past and saw that new technology usually brought about new jobs and employment. But I have problems with this view. First, I would argue this time is different. Many economists talk as if AI will complement workers' jobs, but I don't think that's going to happen, because at some point, AI will be able to just completely replace people. 
I mean, if an AI is at least as capable as your average person, but can be massively produced, way cheaper, and won't unionize, then why choose humans at all? The second reason is that when a new technology is invented that increases productivity, wages usually fall and labor unrest follows. So when automation eventually rolls around, wages will most definitely fall, but this time, I don't think labor movements will be successful unless something changes. To see why this is the case, we'll first need to talk about Okay, so I'm just going to start at the Industrial Revolution. During Industrial Revolution, skilled craftsmen and artisans were replaced with machinery, and these machines were operated by low-skilled workers who would have been apprentices a century prior. See, the thing about craftsmen and artisans before Industrial Revolution was that they owned their own means of production, and they would hire apprentices to eventually become master craftsmen and artisans themselves, thus spreading the trade knowledge. But the invention of heavy machinery changed all of that. Now, the means of production were instead owned by capitalist class, and instead of training apprentices, they hired low-skilled workers to operate heavy machinery. The workers, then, didn't get valuable training beside whatever was necessary to operate the machinery, and thus keeping them there as labor for the capitalist class. Then, other skilled workers and artisans were wiped out because they couldn't compete with cheap goods produced by heavy machinery. This, along with pissed-off workers who noticed their wages had stagnated while productivity kept increasing, led to Luddite riots, where they burned down textile factories and destroyed heavy machinery. And in turn, the government executed many of them. Like, for example, after the passing of the Destruction of Stocking Frames Etc. Act of 1812. Now, it's important to note, however, that the Luddites were not against machines per se, but rather they wanted the profit to be shared more equitably, which, I mean, that sounds reasonable enough, right? Except stuff like this kept happening over and over again. That's kinda weird, right? So anyways, eventually, and I'm skipping a lot of stuff here, workers were able to fight back and form unions, which gave them more bargaining power and increased their wages. Anyways, this is just an extremely brief summary of labor in the Industrial Revolution. If you want a more detailed explanation, I recommend Do Not Eat One's video on the history of labor. It's really, really good. So when economists say technology brought about new jobs, well, yeah, that's technically true. People had to die to make those jobs not shit. They had to unionize, they had to fight business owners and governments to increase their wages. But here's the kicker. Union memberships in countries where automation will be deployed first are declining rapidly. And it looks like this trend won't reverse anytime soon. What's worse, in the future, if the only jobs left available are bullshit jobs with bullshit pay, and workers will have to compete with each other harder, it will make it even more difficult for workers to unionize. And believe it or not, we've actually been seeing it happening for a while now. See. Wealth inequality has been growing for the past 30 years. If you look at the data, specifically the US, this is happening because the middle income jobs are being obliterated and workers are more likely to fill in low paying jobs rather than high paying ones. This shift in income distribution is caused by globalization and automation. This results in people willing to undercut each other for low paying insecure jobs. As an article by Adam Booth puts it, those replaced by new technology are not retrained and re-educated in order to give them the skills required to keep up with this ever-accelerating treadmill of capitalism. Instead, they are thrown onto the scrap heap and forced into the rapidly expanding gig economy, a shadowy netherworld of bogus self-employment, insecure work, and zero-hour contracts. And in the future, if AI is capable of some sort of critical thinking, many high-paying jobs will also be obliterated. What's left will be low-paying, customer-facing service jobs, and with vast army of underemployed and unemployed people, wages will be driven down even further because high labor supply will ensure that there will be people willing to take the lowest pay. And this is gonna be worse for the global south yet again, because capital moves but human labor can't. In the past, we've seen the outsourcing and offshoring of manufacturing sector to developing nations because labor, usually the most expensive cost of a business, is way cheaper here. But robots will be even cheaper, because they don't ask for a raise, they don't unionize, they don't need off during holidays, they can run literally 24-7. And so on and so on. And again, because capital moves and human labor can't, manufacturing sector will eventually move back to rich countries again, except with little to no job gain in those countries. This will screw over everyone, pretty much. Especially in developing countries yet again, because it will leave a vast amount of people unemployed all over the world. Imagine what that world would look like when a big portion of the people will have to live paycheck to paycheck if they have jobs at all. Social mobility will be damn near impossible. 
and the version of UBI that is currently being championed won't help with that, but that's another video. I mean, look at Western countries today. Y'all have stagnating wages and gigantic income inequality, and everyone is damn near pissed off all the time. Can you imagine what a much worse version of today would look like? Well, let me tell you about... Techno-fascism. Yeah, that sounds really dramatic. And okay, I admit, this next part is mostly just me speculating on what can happen given some, I would argue, reasonable assumptions. So, you know, take everything I'm saying with the biggest grain of salt you can find. But I think it's important for us to recognize how technology might help fascists in the future so that we can fight them more effectively. Oh, and also, before we continue, I'm pretty sure you probably have a good intuition of what fascism is. But I would still recommend you read Umberto Eco's Ur Fascism. I mean, it's only like 10 pages long. Or, if you're more a visual medium type like me, ContraPoints, Philosophy Tube, and Angie Speaks have all done great videos on fascism. Also, in this section, I'm going to lump in alt-right, neo-Nazi, white nationalist, and the like as fascist. Though, in other contexts, it's not exactly accurate. Fascism has been on the rise lately. Not just in Western countries either. I mean, I would argue ISIS is, or was, I guess, a fascist group because they tick almost all of the boxes. I mean, they're traditionalist, they reject what they call Western decadence, shun critical thinking, they stamp out ideological and belief diversity, they're obsessed with martyrdom, and they're essentially a death cult. You also have leaders like Erdogan, Orban, Bolsonaro, and Duterte, which flirt with straight-up fashy ideas and do fashy things. And then, of course, you have Western countries themselves. Like, literally all of them now are plagued by fascist or fascist-adjacent organizations. I'm not gonna name names here, but you probably know what I'm talking about. So, we really should ask ourselves, why the hell is this happening now? Well, some might argue it's a reaction to terrorism, specifically fundamentalist Islamic terrorism. But, I mean, I used to live in the US for like a decade at the height of the war on terror, and the fascia elements weren't this overt. Sure, there was a patriotic fervor going on, I support the troops and all of that. But there weren't people advancing ridiculous conspiracy theories about white genocide or other fashy bullshit like that. At least, not in the mainstream. The xenophobia and racism back then was more, let's say, subtle, under the surface. Kind of condescending, even. Nowadays, though, it's just straight up out in the open, with people being able to say shit that would have gotten them ostracized just a decade ago. So what the hell happened? Well, 2008 happened. Two things. First, the world's economy crumbled apart and threw so many people into precarious economic situation. Second, right-wing fearmongers blamed the liberal elites, which in this case was represented by Obama, for the economic meltdown. They weren't exactly wrong, but then they went further and started a narrative that lumped in together pretty much everyone not on the right with the elites, especially left-wing activists, immigrants, and ethnic minorities. I mean, people like Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck pretty much started the narrative about how the liberal elites, along with minorities and immigrants, who are all secret commies, hate America because... something something freedom. And it was really, really profitable. For a time, Fox News was the most watched news in America. I remember going to a friend's parents' house and it was always Fox News playing on TV. Other grifters then saw how profitable it was to scaremonger and exploit the atmosphere of fear due to economic precarity. Instead of blaming the rich and the politicians who helped them, these grifters blamed the others. Immigrants, people of color, the poor, LGBTQ plus people, secret cabal of socialists and globalists, and so on and so on. And, as time goes on, the narrative got wilder and wilder, until eventually fascists were able to embed their ideas in the mainstream. So now, here we are, with the free market at work spreading misinformation and lies through a torrent of deceptive social media posts. And, as long as this capitalist crisis is not addressed, fascism will linger. On the video The Function of Fascism by Kay and Skittles, which is really really good by the way, they said, Fascist movements, much like revolutionary movements, come into existence in times of crisis when the wealthy class of landlords and business owners fears the possibility of an impending worker uprising, and or when the monopolies that capitalism produces leads to a decline in investment and a possible financial crash. Fascists ally themselves with these economic elites, striking deals for their support and funding in return for them ensuring they protect the economic and social status of those elites. Thus, fascist governments have always protected and indeed championed inequality and corporate interests, while leaving the option open for state intervention in the favor of those corporate interests. That sounds eerily familiar, right? 
Right now, wealth inequality is at an all-time high, and people are scared because they are in precarious economic situations. And then there are opportunistic assholes spouting nativist bullshit, fear-monger about refugees, and unfortunately, climate change is just gonna make it worse in the future. I mean, we've seen this in the past. Capitalism got into some sort of crisis of its own making. Fascists started to blame the others. Then the capitalist class gave them power and tried to preserve the capitalist structure. And as more and more wealth are accumulating at the top, how likely is it, do you think, that the capitalist class will be willing to redistribute their wealth? I mean, in the past, they would rather hand the power to fascists to smash leftist movements and roll back worker protection laws than share their power. And this is where it gets a lot worse for almost everyone else in the future. See, right now, the technological capital for everything is solely in the hands of the rich. From the undersea cables, to millions of servers in server farms, to the software used to run the internet, they're all owned by them. And no matter what the anarcho-primitivists tell you, we do need the internet to live in this modern world. Right now, humans still control the internet, but more and more tasks, mostly moderation and such, are being done by AI. And I argue that at some point in the future, if AI is used to make decisions that run companies, AI will favor fascist groups rather than leftist ones based on six assumptions. Assumption number one. The current neoliberal system is unstable because wealth inequality is increasing and climate change will destabilize the world's economy. If you haven't seen the first part of this video, you should check it out because over there I talked about how climate change is going to destabilize world's economy. This will be on top of automation, which will replace a lot of workers, which will create massive unrest. Assumption number two, workers slash leftist movements harm the current capitalist structure. Assumption number three, fascism has been successfully used to preserve capitalism in the past. See Francisco Franco in Spain and Augusto Pinochet in Chile. Assumption number four, AI will be designed to maximize profit and hence requires the preservation of capitalism. Assumption number five, in the future, AI will be able to model the world accurately to a certain extent. Which leads us to assumption number six. AI will be used to make many high-level decisions in big companies. If all of those assumptions holds true in the future, AI will then be more likely to use its power to prop up fascists. This is what I'm going to call techno-fascism, or fascism propped up not necessarily by the rich or the capitalist class, mostly because they might not even realize the machines are doing it, but by algorithms whose main objective function is to maximize profit. You can kinda already see this happening today with algorithms recommending fashy contents, though for a completely different reason. But so far, all of them have been stopped because someone somewhere said, hold up, this is bad. This looks, sounds, and smells like fascism. This is bad, we need to stop it. Because, you know, some people still have morals, but machines don't, at least not inherently. Now, don't get me wrong, ideas that implicitly support fascist ideology are widespread on social media, dominating even, but straight-up fascist contents are still removed when they pop out. That's the way it's supposed to work anyways. The reality might be a little bit different. See, the current fascist objectives don't quite line up with the current capitalists' objectives. Selling hate still tends to put a lot of people off, so tech companies don't really want to be seen cozying up with those people. At some point in the future, though, that might change. If worker movements start hurting their bottom line, then it is only logical for them to try to quell those movements without having to spend a lot of money. A great way to do that, if you look at history, is to prop up fascist and weaken labor movements. And again, these decisions might not be made by humans, because remember, a lot of them would have been replaced by machines at this point. I mean, let me put it this way. If AI ends up controlling our means of communication, what's stopping them from subtly manipulating what we see or hear on the internet? What? You might scream at the monitor. That's goddamn outlandish. Ridiculous. How'd they even do it? Well, dear viewer, I'm glad you ask. Do you use Twitter or Reddit? I mean, if you're watching this, chances are you found me on Reddit or Twitter. Maybe it was the BreadTube subreddit, or, you know, maybe a generous soul decided to share this video, which, if you did, I genuinely appreciate it. But who gets to choose what you see on your feed? Like, there's no way in hell a real person is doing that, because there's just too much stuff streaming from people's brains straight to the internet. So there has to be some sort of algorithm that picks them for you. Let's take Twitter as an example. And let's say you're following between 800 to 2,000 people, which, from my cursory research, seems like a reasonable number. Now, 500 million tweets are sent per day, 
and there are about 326 million active users on Twitter. This means, on average, each active user sends about 1.5 tweets per day. So there should be around 1,200 to 3,000 tweets flooding your timeline every day. And this is an underestimation, because you follow people precisely because they tweet stuff that you find interesting, so they probably send more than 1.5 tweets per day. Now, obviously, not all of those tweets will be shown to your feed, so Twitter algorithm picks them for you. I don't exactly know how it works, but if I were to make an educated guess, it probably looks at engagement metric, how much interaction you have with that person, language usage, time, and stuff like that. Now, what if some pernicious god wants to change your belief? Do you think it would be able to do it with just Twitter? I mean, maybe it starts with Twitter suddenly recommending a person for you to follow, so you follow this person. Maybe this person makes funny memes or some shit that you really, really like. You press like on all of their tweets and you retweet a couple of them that you really identify with. And slowly, this god is building your personality profile. Next, this person retweets another person and you find their tweets really interesting, so you follow them too. This keeps happening until most of the people you follow, you know them through that one person. And this god then would be able to change your belief just by flooding your feed with content geared towards certain perspective. Do you know why I think this can happen? Because it happened to me, although it was to the left and with YouTube. I mean, I wasn't a reactionary or a conservative, but I was liberal. Then one day YouTube recommended H. Bomber Guy's video on Sherlock, I think it was. And I thought, hey, this guy's really funny. So I checked out his other videos. One video led to another, and that's pretty much how I got started on leftism. A video about how Sherlock is garbage. Just kind of funny, I think. The system used by tech companies today, however, is undirected. What's recommended is what's popular, and what's popular is recommended by the system. It's sort of blind, only reflecting the bias of the people who are using it and the people who designed it. In the future, though, AI might be self-directed towards certain ideology that can help them complete their main objective, which is profit. If the AI thinks some content, any content, harms their main objective, it will simply just not recommend them, or they won't show up in feeds. If they need to change minds, they can start by building personality profiles, then recommend content closest to the beliefs of the targets, and then recommend more and more progressively fashy contents that line up with their objective. And finally, if they can't change someone's mind, then they'll just quarantine that person within an isolated group. Actually, let's get into more detail on how an AI might isolate groups and individuals. See, if the AI doesn't like a person's post, for example, if it has some sort of anti-capitalist message, it can show that post only to people who disagree with it, essentially making sure they're attacked for their view. And it won't have to be real people either. Bots will do the trick. It will make it as if that view is unpopular in the eyes of that user, and that might cause them to change their mind. If that doesn't do the trick, the AI can instead isolate the person by nudging them into an isolated social group within the network. The AI can do this by doing the reverse, showing the posts only to people who will agree with them on a set of extremely narrow topics all of the time. And again, it doesn't have to be real people either, bots will also do the trick here. These groups will rarely interact with the general public or each other, or if they do, it is specifically done to pit groups that are normally allies against one another as a way to establish distinct and detached group identities for their members. To make the groups seem more legitimate, bots can be used as a sort of filler, making sure to keep advancing some sort of narrative that can be used to perpetuate the group. This is what I meant when the title said atomize. Divide people into smaller and smaller groups that are extremely isolated and can't communicate with each other, or when they do, they're fighting one another. So in the future, if leftist groups and people are atomized into smaller and smaller units, it will be harder to gather enough people to organize any sort of collective actions through the internet. But it will be the reverse for the other side, because remember, the AI's objective is profit, which requires the preservation of capitalist structure, and fascists preserve capitalist structure. It is logical, then, to conclude that it will be much easier for fascists to organize, precisely because they will be propped up by the AI. It will also be harder to disseminate leftist information through the internet, not because it will be removed, but rather because it will only circulate in smaller and smaller groups without ever coming into contact with the general population. And again, it will be the other way around on the other side. I couldn't fit this anywhere else, so I'm just gonna say it here. What I've been talking about since the beginning of this part is essentially an extension of an article by, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name, Francois Cholet, I think. It's a speculative opinion, his words, not mine, about how social media will be used to control people in the future. 
he talked about the technical detail in the article, and I added the political stuff. Not really related, but this person is how I got started with deep learning in the first place, because he made one of the best, easiest to use neural networks framework out there. So, you know, if you want to read it straight from the expert, check out his article. But unlike climate change, which requires the overhaul of our society to fix, this one is totally preventable. So let's talk about... Of course, none of these are guaranteed to happen. But seeing what happened a couple weeks ago, we really shouldn't leave it to chance. We really, really need to make sure automation won't lead us to a dark path filled with economic insecurity and techno-fascism. Now, granted, I'm just some idiotic asshole from the global south, but I have a couple suggestions. First, we have to keep fighting fascism in all of its forms, both online and offline. Support your local Antifa. Deplatform fascists whenever possible because it actually works. Expose them to the world. We need to make sure fascism will never be an acceptable ideology anywhere on earth. Second, build strong communities, both online and offline. Whatever some people might say, the internet is a great way to build communities. I know that sounds like some neoliberal bullshit, but it's actually true. Get to know your comrades and don't fall into bullshit call-out culture. People, wherever they are, will tend to form groups, but make sure those groups are not isolated. I mean, y'all don't have to agree on everything, but cooperation between groups is really damn important. Build strong connections through multiple channels, just in case some of them are compromised. And most importantly, translate whatever you have online into real-world action. We have to keep this up in the coming decades too, so people who are already experienced need to teach how to organize and build communities to the next generation because the fascists will do the same and we can be fragmented to fight them. Third, support the decentralization of technology. See, most neural network architectures are open to the public. The reason tech companies can do that is because the architecture is not the hard part of building an AI gathering huge amount of data and training it are. I'm pretty sure in the future there will be projects that will try to build AI, but open source and with better objectives than mega corporations. The problem is that it will need a huge amount of computation to train it, so they will probably use distributed computing to do that. You will be able to help them by giving some of your computing power to them when your computer is not being used, like how CERN, the uh, Hadron Collider people, use distributed computing to help them run physics simulations. And if you're a computer scientist or a software engineer, look up this paper. The link should be in the description. Lastly, and I think this is the most important part, the underlying condition that caused all of this needs to be changed. I'm not going to pretend like I have the answer to this one, but right now, the least anyone can do is to vote. That's like the bare minimum anyone can do. Now, do I know for certain these things will happen? No, of course not. I'm not Nostradamus or David Blaine or Jesus. With climate change, I'm not the one who made the catastrophic predictions. Scientists have been screaming about it for the past two decades. With underemployment brought about by AI, also not me. Economists have been saying that if we don't do anything, shit will hit the fan. And they've been saying that for the past 10 years. But what I'm putting forward is some sort of logical conclusion, given that both climate change and automation will inexorably change our world for better or, more likely, for the worse. And as a response to that upheaval, I think many fascist or fascist-adjacent governments will pop up all over the world. They probably won't call themselves fascist, but it will be some sort of nationalistic and capitalistic authoritarianism. And this brand of fascism might wax and wane over the coming decades, but I think it will grow more and more popular over a long period of time unless we do something about it. Or maybe I'm just wearing doom-tinted glasses and wildly extrapolating from trends that won't last. But do you want to risk it? Hey, you got this far. Thank you for watching. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at whatever is on the screen right now or in the description. Um, if you like this video, maybe the idea of the video, maybe not so much as the execution of the video, maybe you want to share it because I know the execution of this video is not very good. But yeah, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, what else? Oh, the next video I'm gonna do is on fascism again, I think, or UBI. So, you know, subscribe, I guess.
Anyways, bye.